Short Lives of the Dominican Saints by a Sister of the Congregation of St. Catherine of Siena Edited with an introduction by the Very Reverend Father Proctor, the Provincial Published in London by Keegan Paul Trench Trubiner and Company Limited, Paternoster House, Charing Cross Road Published in 1901. Introduction This book is an album of Dominican pictures. The pictures are word painted and not lined in crayon or oil. They are drawn with a graphic pen and not painted with an artist's brush. They are pictures all the same lifelike, faithful, and true. Each chapter, and there are nearly a hundred of them, is a portrait, the original of which once lived in a Dominican cloister, in a convent house, in an ancestral hall, in a princely or lowly mansion, or, like Jesus of Nazareth, in a lowly cottage amongst simple, humble, working folk, who earned their daily bread by the sweat of their brow. They are offered to the reader for the, his study, his admiration, and maybe even for his imitation. There are lights and shades in all these pictures, as we are lights and shades in every human life. If we accept one, one that has ever lived, or will be lived, from Eden to Jehoshaphat, from the dawn of creation to its doom. Each of these pictures tells its own story. Each teaches its own lesson. Each preaches his own sermon. Each is a picture from the life and from a holy life. For each is the life of a saint. The word saint is used in its comprehensive sense. All the stories of whose lives are here briefly told are not canonized saints. Some are only beati, or the beatified of St. Dominic's order. They await the church's final seal. Not one of the very large number beatified by the voice of the people, but not as yet declared blessed by the voice of the church, finds a place in this book. There are several portraits introduced into this Dominican series over which St. Dominic has no right or claim. They are painted here because they have a claim upon him or his. On account of signal services rendered to the order in the hour of the order's need. St. Augustine of Hippo whose rule St. Dominic adopted in accordance with the decree of the Fourth Lateran Council, prohibiting the introduction of new religious rules. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Dominic's twin brother, brought forth together by the Holy Mother Church, as the old chronicler puts it, though their ways were divided and their lives were lived apart, St. Mary Magdalene and St. Catherine, the Virgin Martyr of Alexandria, each of whom is called Protectrix of the Order, for reasons given in their respective lives. To these are added two feasts intimately connected with the Dominican life and work, the Feast of Our Lady's Patronage and the preeminently Dominican Feast of Rosary Sunday. These lives are necessarily short, since all have to be compressed between the covers of a single octavo volume. Their very brevity may add to their charm, and may induce many to read them. Perhaps, having read these, they may be drawn to read other lives of the same saints, which are more exhaustive than these owing to the limited space allowed to each, can possibly be. 
Though necessarily miniatures, the pictures in this album are faithfully drawn, drawn from life. The principal authorities from which these facts are taken are Marchesi's Diario Dominiciano, The Lessons in the Dominican Breviary, and the excellent work Le Ani Dominicaine. Although the Ani Dominique already numbers 16 large volumes, the compilers have only as yet reached the end of the month of August. Consequently, the writer of these little sketches has not had the invaluable help of that work in drawing up the histories of the saints whose feasts occur in the four months subsequent to August. For, as will be seen, the order followed in these short lives is neither alphabetical nor chronological. It is one suggested by the calendar of the Dominican Rite. The lesson of the lives is not far to seek. The object of the writer, if hidden, is hidden behind a transparent veil. The short suggestive prayer at the end of each chapter reveals the design of the author's mind, the prayers being translations of the colic said in the Mass on the Saint's Feast. Pictoribus atque poetis quid libet Audende semper fuit aqua potestus means that the painters and poets have always had the power of daring whatever their fancy prompted. The fancy of the word painter of this Dominican album was assuredly this to make the sainted children of St. Dominic speak after death, preach by their lives and carry on their apostolate among men. The book now offered to the pious reader is the result, the happy result of this daring. It is not a book of precepts, it is a book of examples. It is not Christianity or the higher and perfect state of the Christian life in the abstract. It is all this, but in the concrete. It is not a treatise on ascetic theology, both in the cloister and in the world. It does not tell us what ought to be done. It reveals to us what has been done. Synthetically, it shows what can be done. It becomes more practical still. It proves what we may do. There is no reading perhaps so dry, none that appeals with so little force, even to the omnivorous reader, as the reading of sermons. Even though the sermons were preached by earnest and eloquent men, in the average library sermon books remain uncut or are relegated to the highest shelves. Who reads the sermons of St. Thomas, St. Bernard, St. Augustine for reading's sake? Who even, unless he be a preacher, is interested in Bossuet's once impassioned, now passionless, once eloquent, but now fireless discourses, or in the conferences of La Cordere? On the other hand, the statistics of librarians will reveal few books are more in request than the books of biography. Biographical reading is almost invariably interesting, fascinating even, and absorbing sometimes, although the subject of the biography may not have been fascinating or absorbing himself. Carlyle had experienced this when he wrote, Biography is the most universally pleasant, 
the most universally pro profitable of all reading. The books in the popular lending library, which are on the lower shelves within easy reach, which are dog-eared and thumb-marked, are those which do not report words, but which recount deeds, which reproduce the living life of the living or the dead. The reason of this choice of books is simple. The printed sermon lacks life. The soul has gone from the words. It passed away with the sound of the preacher's living voice. The sermon in this book is dead, and the book is its grave. The same in its degree may be said of, of a book of speeches. Oh, that my enemy would write a book, especially if it be a book of his sermons, or even of his eloquent speeches. Biography is not a record of words that are lifeless. It is life relived in the imagination and mind of the reader. He whose life is read, although he be dead, yet speaketh. The word of the biographer is akin to the art of the painter. A well-written biography, like a skillfully lined picture, opens the closed tomb, takes the dead by the hand, and makes him alive again. We see him, we hear him, we are almost sensible of his presence. Even in reading a readable novel, although we are assured by the author that the characters have no existence in real life, but are purely imaginary cre creations, they seem to live in our lives and form part of our living surroundings. We are interested in them, and in their saying, and their doings, even as though we heard and saw them. When the novel is finished, we are loath to part with them. It is like saying goodbye to old friends. Much more is this true of those who are not creatures of the writer's imagination, but who once really lived as we live now, and in those lives we have a practical interest. More especially, again, is this true if they whose lives are portrayed followed in their day the mode of life which we are following in ours, if they observed the rule of which that we make profession, if we were guided by principles which guide us, and if they even wore the symbol, even wore the very dress which we are wearing, and as a, sim as a symbol and a sign of the life, the principles and the profession common to them and ourselves. Hagiography is an apostolate. The hagiologist is an apostle. Remember, remember the days of old. Think upon every generation. Ask thy father, and he will declare thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. The biographer recalls the days of old. He makes past generations, which are dead and buried live again. He bids our fathers who have gone declare to us who remain, and under the potent spell of his facile pen our elders are constrained to tell us what was thought and said and done in the day whose night has now come. Hagiographers are biographers of saints. Hagiology brings saints' lives within measurable distance of our own, and inspires us to preach to us by the irresistible eloquence of example. The sermon is Christianity in theory. A saint's life is Christianity in practice. Practical men 
and we are all practical men in these practical days, are affected more by the concrete than by the abstract gospel of truth. An ounce of practice is worth a pound of preaching, is a proverb none the less true for being old. Every preacher knows that, if his audience is getting restless, an anecdote from real life will recall their attention. I remember, or a few years ago, or as I was coming to this church tonight, I met a young man, will command, yes, command, the ears and minds and rivet the attention, not only of children, but those of those grown old and who are growing old, when what is called eloquence will fail. In the eloquence of living example, which appeals to living men, the wise old Seneca said and wrote many a wise word, but none wiser than this. Men believe their eyes rather than their ears. They are moved by deeds, whereas words, like a butterfly's wing, touch them in passing, but leave neither mark nor impression. St. Augustine has the same idea, but he expresses it in a still more forcible way. You may hear the word formed by the voice. You must hear the voice of the life, or literally, the voice of a word sounds, the voice of example thunders. St. Augustine was converted by the voice of example. He tells us in the eighth book of his Confessions that, in the great contention of his inward dwelling, he turned to his friend Alypius and exclaimed, What ails us? The unlearned start up and take heaven by force, while we, with our learning and without heart, Lo, where we wallow in flesh and blood, are we ashamed to follow because others are gone before, and not ashamed not to follow? The future saint gives us the answer before the end of the book. Instantly, by a light of serenity, as it were, infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. The opening of the next chapter, or book of confessions, epitomizes his future life. O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast broken my bonds asunder. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of praise. These two courtiers, the history of those conversions, led up to St. Augustine's own consecration to God's service, were won to God by the chance reading of a little book on the life of St. Anthony. Biography was the apostolate to which the Church is indebted for the change wrought throughout in the worldly spirit of Ignatius of Loyola, and for the miracle of grace which made him a valiant champion of justice and truth. A book of the lives of our saviors and the saints was brought him. He read them at first only to pass away the time. He admired their love of solitude and of the cross. Then came the firm resolution to imitate the saints. Finally, he himself became a saint, a warrior saint in the army of the Lord, and the captain of a company of saints, whose name is Legion. In reading the life stories of God's servants, we are not merely listening to the words of holy men. We are watching their actions, 
and so we are awakened from our sleep by the thunder of their example. It has been said, men will wrangle for religion, write for it, fight for it, die for it, anything but live for it. In Christian biography we have the convincing evidence of those who lived for religion. This is the testimony of the pages which follow these words. The writer of these pages, the painter of these word pictures, in presenting to us the words and ways of the very saintly children of St. Dominic, has given us all something to think about. More than that, something to do, such as to realize in our own lives the ideals portrayed in the saints' lives. St. Augustine reminds us that it is an easy and simple thing to honor a martyr, but that it is a great and better thing to imitate his faith and his patience. St. John Chrysostom goes beyond this and tells us that one who is edified by a meritorious life of a saint ought to take delight in following him in his service of God, and that, to be consistent, if he will not imitate the saint's life, he ought not to praise it. In looking through the lives, almost a hundred in number, briefly, and yet pithily recorded in this volume, is there not one, gentle reader, which comes home to you? Is there none that appeals to you? Not one which seems to have been what your life might ought to be, ought to be, may be, shall I add, will be? In a palace at Würzburg, there is a room lined with mirrors. Wherever you look, you see yourself reflected in the crystal clear. In this Dominican album which you hold in your hand, there is a series of pictures which you are at the same time mirrors. Is there not one in which you may see yourself reflected? Not perhaps as you are, but what you once were, or what you have fallen from, or what you may rise to, what may you begin again? There are mirror pictures for all, for young, for aged, for those in middle life, for the priest and for the layman, for the cloistered nun and for the lady living in the world, for the religious praying in the choir to studying in his cell, and for the man of the world who in the busy marts of life, for the disciple and the professor, for the powerful and the glad of heart, for the learned and the unlettered, the tepid and the fervent, for the laggard and the sluggard, as well as for the hero and the saint. All have a place in this volume of Dominican portraits. They were not all saints always. They were not all consistently and persistently holy. But all became saints, all died saints, and all are now saints in the kingdom of saints. As we look at these pictures, the questions which appeal with such unerring force to St. Augustine appeals with equal force to us. Canst thou not what these youths, what these maidens can? Or can they either in themselves, and not rather in the Lord their God? If we cannot imitate all, can we assuredly imitate some? As we scan their faces and study their lives, we can hardly fail to find whoever and whatever they may be, a model which we could choose as our ideal. They were all men or women, either young or older. They were all made 
in the same mold and of the same flesh and blood and human spirit as we are. Each had passions to conquer and to overcome concupiscence, to master and subdue, an unbridled tongue to curb, an untamed nature to tame. Bodily senses which weighed down the soul. Each lived in a world set in iniquity, as is our world today. Some were in our position of life, whatever that may be. Some suffered from the very temptations which are buffeting us. Some were our own age had and had a character, temperament, like our own. Some lived in the land, perhaps in our home. Canst thou not what these youths, what these maidens can? Cast thyself upon him, fear not. He will not withdraw himself that thou shouldst fall. Cast thyself fearlessly upon him. He will receive and heal thee. God has given us the same helps and aids which he gave to them. Prayer, penance, the sacraments the intercession of Mary and the saints. He only exacts of us what he exacted of them, self-denial, contempt of the world, purity of mind and heart and life, and union with himself. Walking in their steps, imitating their ways, may be as they were and eventually as they are. We can do what these youths, these maidens did. We are apt to put the saints on pedestals, like Simon Stylites, high up on a lofty pillar which we cannot reach, with aureolas about their heads which would not fit us, and a halo of sanctity around them which apparently would ill become us. In reading, these lives of the saints come down from the pillars. They remove the aureola and hide the halo, and they become what they are, or what, they, or what we may be. How natural these pictures are, and how consolingly natural they reveal the saints to have been even in the midst of the supernatural lives which they led. Grace does not dethrone nature and rule in its stead. It is superseded, superadded to nature, and, without destroying nature, lifts it up and supernaturalizes it, and refines it and sanctifies it. God in giving grace, does not annihilate his former work, he only perfects it. As a wise architect, he builds upon the foundations which he has already firmly laid. As a wise architect, he builds upon the foundations which he has already firmly laid. The Son of Man came not to destroy, but to save. Not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Nature and nature's law remains. Grace only perfects and exalts them. Excelsior is the motto of the saint, and he rises above nature. Sursum corda is God's command to his servants, and their answer comes, Habemus ad dominum. The heart is there. It remains a human heart with human passions, human affections, human love. But it is the lifted up to God. Throughout this book we see this exemplified almost on its every page, and we see it for our own encouragement. God works through nature. Grace perfects, but does not destroy nature and nature's gifts. 
All that God, through grace, destroys is sin. St. Dominic was a man of a deeply earnest nature. He consecrated his earnestness to God and it became zeal. St. Thomas Aquinas would have been great and distinguished in any branch of study, in science, medicine, or law. He devoted himself to sacred lore directed his talents to God, and so became a saint and a doctor of the church. St. Vincent Ferrer was a orator natus, a born orator. He remained an orator while becoming a saint, and consecrating by grace his oratorical power to God in the salvation of souls, he became an ecumenical preacher of the Divine Word and the spiritual father of saints. Saint Antoninus might have been an eminent lawyer, great in the esteem of men. He uses nature's gift for God in the service of the Church and became instead an eminent can canonist and a chosen servant of heaven. St. Rose of Lima, beautiful of feature and of a refined and gentle nature, might have wedded whom she would. She did wed whom she would. She espoused Jesus Christ. And Catherine of Siena had a large loving heart. She might have loved creatures, or she might have been drawn by her loving heart to sin, but she gave that human heart with its human love to God, and he gave her his heart in return. Blessed Henry Suso's history is instructive. He was human, oh, so human. Read his life as it is written in this book, and you will see what I mean. And yet he became, without ceasing to be human, shall I say it, divine, a man of God, a mystic of mystics, the patron and pattern of ascetic saints, even to our own time. Every scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like to the master of a house, who bringeth forth of his treasury new things and old. The scribe of this volume has had this gospel maxim in view. It is not the life of a saint, but a collection of lives of saints. It is not a picture, but a album of pictures. It is not a single mirror, but a room lined with mirrors. We must see all ourselves somewhere. We must find a picture, a picture in the album, which we ought to resemble. We must all, amongst so many lives, find one, at least, which may be our ideal. St. Raymond, the age canonist and well nigh five score, preaches to the old. St. Rose of Lima, dying at the age of thirty-one, and Blessed Imelda at the age of eleven, are models for the young. The high-born and leisured class may find a pattern in Blessed Jane of Portugal, or lowly-born and the man of toil in Blessed Albert of Bergamo. The religious woman in the cloister has only to look to the life of St. Catherine de Ricci and try to copy that life in her own. The woman living in the world may take Blessed Margaret, Margaret of Castello as her model and her guide. The lay brother and lay sister 
will read a lesson in the lives of blessed Martin Porras and blessed James of Ulm. The religious man, working for the souls of others, as well as for his own, may look where he will, but he find everywhere something to learn. The man in the world who wishes not to be of the world is not without his ideal layman. The chronic sufferer from ill health will find a model of patience in Blessed Maria Bar Bartolomea. The lawyer, much abused of men, may gaze upon the portrait of Blessed Peter de Jerem Jeremia and see whether the picture becomes a mirror. The artist, the Catholic artist, who paints not only for gold but for law, but for God, and will find encouragement in the words of Blessed Lawrence of Ripa Frata to Fra Angelico and Fra Benedetto, the artist brothers, both sons of St. Dominic, who are still friars' preachers, preaching by their paintings with an eloquence beyond the eloquence of words. The sailor w has his patron, if not his pattern, in Blessed Gonzales, better known as St. Telmo. To the Lady of Fashion, the Blessed Velana will appeal with greater force than the sermons of Savar Savaranola or Signeri on the vanity of a worldly life. That least of little men, the vain and conceited man, may learn a lesson from the same blessed Gonzales and his fall. Even the apostolate who is repentant has his patron in the blessed Anthony Nerut, first a Dominican, then an apostate from the faith, then a convert, and finally a martyr for the faith which he had renounced. The choice is here. It is for the reader to choose, and when he has chosen, it is for him to study, to admire, and to imitate the patron, the patron and the pattern of his choice. John Proctor, O.P.